um, I had, I was using the uh, T6 and I don't have a remote timer that I have for my Fuji. So I had to use uh, something new that I had not used before and I, I let it take pictures and I thought it was recording it, but it was just showing it. And so after I was done, I checked the, <laughs> the photos and there was just one JPEG that was my test photo. So <laughs> that was a slight mishap. Um, <laughs> happens all the time, but that's okay. Yeah, well, we learn from our mistakes. Yeah. Okay. Sit down and make sure it's okay. Try to hurry because I'm going to get that. Which, 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 more often that way we can learn. Let's see. Dick's computer. So Dick is joining us, friend of Gary Peterson here. I'm here. He just said Dick Gary, is joining. Dick is joining. Dick Dick's, is joining. Dick's oh, Dick computer. Is Dick Beam. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, you want the stand or do you want to use it? No, on the I'm fine. You're okay. Because just the top of your head is showing. I'm confused. Scooch forward. Is Dick here or Dick not? That's me. Hi. <laughs> Hi. He's the there. Invisible, the invisible person. There we go. There we go. <laughs> oh, we have Hi. A medical thing. Okay. Hi. Hi, Dick. Hello. Can you so see me? Uh, no. no. You cannot see me. Can you hear me? You might yes. Just put it in yeah. Like a pad, there's a paddle Share screen. Uh, so you don't have to share screen. Uh oh. You should, you should be able to just turn your video on somehow. Oh, okay. Let's see here. There's a panel mode. Uh, oh, here. Start video. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. There you there go. I am. Oh, there you are. Huh. Okay. So everything's working fine with the telescope. Are you talking to me? Yeah. Oh, the NP-127? Yeah. Uh, I have to get a, um, what do they call it? They call it a large field corrector. For a 35 millimeter camera or larger, they're, uh, larger format sensors, they're, they're saying that you need to have that. So what I suspect happened here is that the, the scope was uh, first released probably, I think, in the early 2000s, maybe 2005 or six or something like that. Uh -huh. Then the sensors, the uh, uh, first full frame sensors came out in 2012. I believe that when they tried these guys on that particular telescope hey. it didn't work out and so they had to yes, make it you correct did. yeah you see my email that i sent the same the same one um i don't see an email today from you well it was maybe yesterday okay that'd be the seventh yeah so it should be one from webmaster at spau yeah and no, going back to the fifth i don't see one and you can go back the last week and click on the zoom link which should, should work also same one we always used to use yes uh -huh. they just okay i'll give it a try all right we got seven people here so far okay see ya. very good Bye. hello gail and we have our names or my name is astro zoom i guess that's not a very good name <laughs> To change that to Tom, Totten, hosting. So I sold Dick a telescope. So NP-127, uh, is that a Teleview? Yes. Yeah. So, sounds nice. Yes, it is. So and so that, that's the, where I'm at right now is I need to get the corrector to actually use it with a full- The expensive? Sorry? Does it cost, Does it cost a lot? No, it's about, uh, I think it's about 240, 240 bucks. And uh, so I'm just waiting for that guy to come. See, I think what happened here was when they came out with the full frame cameras was uh, tw uh, about 2012. I think Sony was the first one to come out with full frame. And so when they put that in there in the sensor, 
was larger than, let's say, the human eye is what, maybe about 22 millimeters max. Uh, I don't know what these AP sensors, they're in the 20s, I think, as well. So when the full frame came out, your 35 millimeter, some kind of aberrations appear. Now, what I'm seeing is what I would call, I'm going to call it, I'm, it's my own term, I'm going to call it diffraction vignetting. Uh, it seems to affect the halos of the stars. Uh, the actual, uh, everything else, the nebulosity seems fine. Her. Her. Yeah. That, so that, I'm guessing that corrector will fix that problem. Now, I've done some edge testing where I've, got, I've actually got sh made shots of each of the corners, okay, uh, and magnified, digitally magnified those guys a little bit. And the stars look nice and round. But if you out of focus a star, depending on how far away it is from the center line of the optical train, what happens is it starts to do this sort of squish thing. Instead of getting a round disc, you're getting a squish thing. And uh, depending on how far you are, more squished it gets. So if you start in the center, you're circular. And as you get further and further away, that's mm -hmm. when this effect starts to happen. So I'm guessing that when they had the AP sensors, you're okay because you're in that range where that doesn't have a problem. When you start to get out further away from that, that's when you see this. What's weird about it is the stars themselves, if, there's, if they're faint stars without halos, they appear nice and round. It's only the halos that seem to be affected. And it mm -hmm. makes these halo patterns like a radiated out pattern. Uh, I could probably even show you some pictures of what it actually looks like. Yeah. But that's, that's what it's doing right now. Uh, I don't believe it is the telescope itself. And the newest version is the IS version, which stands for Imaging Systems. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I can see that they really did with that is they went to 2.4 inch focusing tube as opposed to two inch. I think it's kind of a gimmick because the doggone thing's built like a tank right now. And they did it for larger payloads. Well, I mean, I got the 6D on there right now. I don't know why that wouldn't work. Yeah, you went up, well, I went down. The big news I, is I sold the cave. I finally sold the cave. I oh, went, you did? Yeah, congratulations. Yeah. Good for Who you. Bought Who bought it, Gary? Uh, somebody in Tustin. Oh. <laughs> so, Gary, Gary, did they come and get it, or is it still waiting to be picked up? Waiting to be picked up. But okay. I got the money. I got the cash money. So, what size uh, was it? Eight inch. Uh, okay, I, I owned a 10 inch F8. cave for quite a few years. Was an eight inch F8? Yeah, F8. Yep. I had a 10 inch oh, F6, I think it was F, and it was, it was shorter focus. So I can can I interrupt right now and say uh, we've got maybe a new face with Dick uh, on the on the screen here. Uh, Gary's friend and and Dick, where are you located? I'm located in Paso Robles, uh, just is just outside of the city limits, uh, by the uh, on the other side of the airport. So you probably go to Cal. You probably go to CalStar. Huh? I have never been. I, I I'm a, I've been kind of in uh, back into astronomy in the last three years. I used to volunteer when I was young in a college observatory. And that's kind of how I got started. That's back in the days when we used film and then spectroscopic film was what I used. Great, great. Uh, so folks in here, we have Hank up in my right-hand corner is uh, local to Santa Barbara. Bob Gutenberg, Gruenberg is in the center for me. Joe Doyle, got Chuck McPartland, our outreach coordinator. Robert Richard lives down in Phoenix area. Wow. Gail is listening in. She, she's not live at the moment, but there, we, she's probably listening to us. Uh, Jerry, our president, is down there. And Gary, you know, from Pomo. So that's a pretty good group for tonight, 10 of us. And um, I think we should uh, start any other. So you're, you're, you were describing a Teleview telescope that you got from Gary, huh? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of mount do you have it on? Uh, I've got an Atlas uh, EQAZ Pro. So that's and, Orion. Uh, so it's plenty for that scope. As a matter of fact, it was tracking really good. I was I was I was on the Rosette, 
and uh, it was doing very, very well. Uh, so uh, I, I thought it was, you know, I only took a couple weights and I put a 10 inch astrograph on there and that's three weights with it, with a shaft extension. So, yeah. So, so Dick, how, how dark is your yard? You know, I would say the scene is okay. Um, I live on uh, about two and a half acres of land. Uh -huh. uh, and as I said, we're kind of just just in the uh, in the county here and, and the outsides of the city limits used to be really good here. Uh, but then when they put Barney Schwartz Park in, it kind of made a lot of light. There's a lot of stadium lights coming. From that really? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's still good. Uh, yeah, I bet it's a lot darker than, our, than my yard. Yeah. And I'm planning on yeah. putting in, uh, an observatory. Uh -huh. That's what I'm working on right now. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. Hey, Tim. Hi. Hi, Tim. How are you? So does anyone have any immediate uh, questions about their scopes or astrophotography they want answered? Any questions? I, I, I have a question. Tom, uh, Tom, this is sort of half peripheral, but did you make an announcement about CalSTAR? Uh, no, I don't think I passed that on myself. Jerry, oh, well. Jerry. But Jerry, I can't remember. Jerry mentioned it somewhere. I put it oh, yeah. in the uh, talking points for the radio show, but I don't think we got to it. But I, uh, Joe Doyle was the one that sent it around right. to us by email. Hey, Joe. Good to see you. Hey, Bob. Good to see you. Yeah, well, anyways, just in case anybody's interested, CalSTAR is out at Lake San Antonio. It's a great event. They're doing a spring and fall version this year. I, f I forget the dates off the top of my head. Uh, fall is in October, and spring is early April, and um, it's a great place. It's really dark. It's quiet. I did fall Cal Star up there, and everybody kept their distance, so nobody got COVID. Nobody was weird, <laughs> and uh, definitely, I'm planning to go again. At least weirder than normal. <laughs> well, yeah, that, I'm glad you qualified that, Jerry. I mean... <laughs> No, okay. regarding, regarding star parties, yeah. I'm, I'm going to the Grand Canyon star party, or actually the Kaibab Lodge uh, star party. Oh, because, good for you. Uh, yeah, uh, June nice. 5 through 12 or something like that. So the, at the Grand Canyon, they have uh, an annual star party. That's, uh, the biggest one is at the South mm -hmm. Grand Canyon, then there's one at the North Grand Canyon, but it just has mm -hmm. a patio, there's not much space, and it's maybe 10 telescopes, and it's purely just for the guests. But then there's also the Kaibab Lodge, which is north of, uh, it's outside the park, but it's about a half hour mm -hmm. drive from, from the Grand Canyon or so. And that's where you know, the, the meadow, and the it should be, uh, should be very the dark. The trouble with that this skies. year is, I'm not sure it's a good year to share views through your telescope. Certainly at CalSTAR last year, nobody looked through anybody else's telescope, just for fear of sharing germs. Mm -hmm. Which sucks, but it's... As long as you have the vaccination, you're, you're safe, hopefully. Yeah, but you don't know. We don't know. Yeah, the, uh, the, the CalSTARs that I go to, they're mostly imaging. So yeah. there is there has been sharing, but uh, also there's a lot to do if you don't share. Yeah, yeah. So I, I want, the I want to mention- not open to the public. It's just for people with telescopes. I want to mention to everybody about the, the controls. Again, you can do gallery view or the speaker view if you want to make the one person talking to be in the center and taking over things. And also, you can turn on chat. And if you have a website that you want people to refer to or some other link or some other comment you want to make, like Gail just made a, a comment in, in the corner saying she's just here to list in. Um, so those, those functions are nice, the chat room and then um, to do the different whether gallery view or whether you do speaker view it's nice to do and you see the background that some of us have uh, you can uh, do that by clicking on the green symbol in the upper left hand corner and going to uh, some kind of somewhere there there's a background you can add in your own uh, photo that you, if you want as your background mm. okay so bob you had a bob gruenberg you had a some kind of question yeah um so you guys are going to know this. It's maybe sort of a dumb question for astrophotography, but so I was I wanted to do a long night expose a bunch of exposures of uh, Thor's helmet uh, the other night, and so it started in the southeast, and then I knew eventually I'm going to have to do a meridian flip, and uh, with the AVX mount, it, it'll avoid a meridian flip if you wanted to, but 
I didn't want to like mess up, you know, it's eventually going to run into trouble. So I, I stopped the capture and then I did a meridian flip. And then when I did the darks and flats and bias, I did them on the Southwest side. And the question is, how do you deal with the camera? Do you rotate the camera by hand when you've done a meridian flip or do you let alignment, you know, stack the stars or, or how does, how does that work? If you, if you want to, stack images from both sides of a meridian flip. I leave the camera locked in place on the scope. I don't change its relationship to the scope in any way. So when you're doing darks and flats and everything, they don't, the, the, the darks and, and the bias won't line up then. The darks and the bias. The, they don't have to line up. They, they are specific to the coordinate system of the focal plane. So they automatically line up. That is, the dark and the flat will characterize the focal plane no matter what it's pointed at, the dark and the flats. Yeah, oh no, the flats won't. The flats will characterize your tube, and the camera needs to stay in the same relationship to the tube um, at before and after the flip. So you can't, you can't change that relative to the scope. So you're, you're saying the software takes care of it, or, or no, how is it? The, 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 um, essentially, yes, but... When you characterize, when you do, a, for example, a bias frame or a dark frame, the camera takes that, uh, whether it's attached to a telescope or not, and whether you're holding it upside down in your lap or you're holding it right side up in your lap, it doesn't matter. You're just characterizing the focal plane, and the coordinate system is in the focal plane. It doesn't have anything to do with what it's looking at outside. The light, the flat frame, which you're trying to get rid of gradients and... Um, What's that thing where the shades at the edge? Um, vignetting. vignetting. Yeah, vignetting. Thank you. That uh, must, your camera must maintain exactly the same relationship to the, to, to the telescope. Um, otherwise, they'll change. So to get a consistent set of flats, you have to lock it to the tube. So I, I was looking at the instructions in PixInsight. And it was saying you should take darks and flats and bias, you know, on one side, use those for those images, and then take another set of them on the other side, which implies, you know, it does make a difference. So. I, I don't believe it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, I tried to use darks and flats and bias from the southwest side on images from the southeast side, and it doesn't seem to have worked very well. Huh. So. Maybe, maybe our terminology is a little different in a subtle way, but I don't think so. I just don't see where anything but a flat frame is going to matter. Well, not a, not a flat frame, but like the dark frames, the hot pixels would be inverted, you know, in the, in the field of view. And no, no, because well, if you don't change the camera, yeah. yeah that, but that, Bob, didn't you say you did change the camera? I didn't change the camera, no. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Yeah, maybe I'm thinking of it wrong. Maybe because the mirrors, it, it, it doesn't. But I, I was just thinking, you know, the telescope is is 180 degrees. It doesn't matter. The camera's, the camera's up is still up. The top of the camera is still the top of the camera. Everything's relative to the camera in, yeah, the, yeah. in those two cases. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll keep trying. I actually have okay. one processing now with... Uh, I've done the Southeast images. They didn't do well. I'm doing them separately. I'm trying the Southwest mm -hmm. and it's just taken a really long time to process because uh, mainly because- uh, When you, when you do the Meridian flip, the, um, the, um, um, the view, the framing will be different. <coughs> yeah. So, that, so the, the actual image that you want, uh, that will be different and you'll have to pick the stars that you want to have aligned from each side. Um, some some programs do that well. Some don't do it. When I process, I do it all manually. I pick seven or eight stars all around the frame, and I tell the camera where where which one, is, or I tell the software which ones those are. And I could put in frames that are upside down, backwards, and stuff. And it'll after I define which stars to line up, it'll all straighten it all out. Yeah. You know, if your secondary mirror shifted a little bit, that could account for what you're describing. Yes, that could account for it. And uh, there is a, a comment that Bob Richard made one time about uh, when I asked, he was presenting at the club um, some images he'd taken. And I asked him about dithering. Did he dither? And he says, I don't have to. It dithers automatically. And uh, 
what that means is that he didn't have something clamped down and every time the shutter changed it jiggled a little bit so it moved yeah. a bit. so you've got to have it clamped down so it's it's rigid yeah i've got i've got it set to dither uh with um phd2 at uh the two settings have a random and yeah. a spiral and uh, that won't have anything to do with it either no i know and that, but you know i'm trying to keep everything locked down the the thing with the dithering is it's supposed to um do that in between it's supposed to move in between images it's not supposed to move while it's while right, it's it taking takes, it takes an image and then it, then it goes and it dithers by the amount and the tolerance you ask it to do yeah and then it sets up and then it takes the next image in your sequence yeah okay well anyway that's all i'll give it another shot if you get anything more specific or you have some frames that puzzle you send them to me by email and i'll look at them yeah i'd be sending more than I could because it's a bunch of like 25, 30 meg files, you know, I mean, really large files. What do you do for your flat frames? 50 darks, 50. Make, how do you make your flat frames? I make them, I make those in the morning, early morning uh, with, um, instead of like a little light tablet or something, I use the, you know, just sky okay. with a, with a t-shirt, you know, t-shirt. Yeah. Yeah, that should work. And then on sharp cap, you can look at the histogram and get the red, green, blue in the right the right, uh, you know, uh, the right amount, you know, so okay. they're, they're not too bright, too dim. So, um, but, and then I'm, the way PixInsight is doing when you do it manually is it, it's a long process. I, I, I've been working on this nine hours today. <laughs> One thing, it didn't turn out that right. well, <laughs> but, I, but I learned a lot and I'm taking a lot of notes, but um, it, it has you make a, uh, a master dark, a master bias, and then uh, a master flat, but you have right. to count the flats first and then make a master you, flat. I didn't catch that word. You have to what the flat? You have to calibrate the, oh, the flat images first and then un unlike the, uh, the the other ones. But um, so I, I don't want to go into too much detail. It was just the, the, the basic question was like, you know, mixing images before and after a meridian flip and then having the uh, the darks and flats and and bias, you know, from just one side, is that is that doable? So yeah, they should be they should be the same. It shouldn't a uh, meridian flip shouldn't matter. Okay, I think I, I, think I asked you guys up. before what what's dithering? Dithering. Well, you you go for it. You tell them. Oh, dithering is what your eye does when you look at a scene. You know, your eye wiggles a little bit. Yeah, it, it measures differencing. This is the astronomical imaging version of that. You take a frame with the telescope on a star field and it's tracking. Then when that subframe is over, you move the telescope a little bit. So it's off by a few picture elements and then you take another frame, but they don't perfectly line up. And this way it gets rid of, um, especially in cameras that don't have good color control like a DSLR. <laughs> There are a good temperature control like a DSLR. It takes the color noise away. It averages it out. Yeah, the the idea I think is that the um, the background noise, if you stay in one spot, may keep being in the same spot. Whereas if you move slightly to the side, it'll go. Oh, that's not a star. That's that's background noise. And it'll be able to eliminate it when you when you stack the frames. So, yeah, okay. that's the way I understand it. Yeah. Okay. Jim, thank you for asking. I didn't know either. Okay. All right. That, that's it. I'll, I'll give it a shot. Thanks. I'll ask all the simple questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, okay. I've got a couple of announcements. Uh, Chuck uh, McPartland just uh, sent an email that Martin Mesa is in the hospital, right, Chuck? Yeah, yeah. he's in Cottage Hospital with COVID-19. Oh, no. Yeah. He Friday, apparently he's been working. You know, he went back to his old job. Oh, delivering boy. things and got exposed and Friday he got a bad fever and was feeling you know totally uh, mm -hmm. fatigued and so Jana took him down to cottage they tested him they said yeah you're positive they basically dragged him off put him in a room and uh, he was on oxygen intermittently for Friday night but then Saturday they put him on oxygen and he just came off of oxygen today this afternoon oh good um, it's a good sign that he came off of it, uh, but he sounds really short of breath. Uh, and of course, Janet can't visit him, so she goes to the parking structure and she can wave at his window and he can wave back. Oh, wow. Um, but hopefully he'll get, get over mm. it. 
Yeah. Yeah. And you sent an email saying that Brother Lawrence got it. Uh, well, I'm not sure. Uh, Ruben sent me an email saying, hey, Ruben, uh, uh, Lawrence misses hearing from people in the AU. Could you please let them know his telephone number? And so I sent it out to people I know that he had been close to. And Ruben implied, he said, and he, he got over the COVID-19 infection, which I had never heard that he got. Mm -hmm. wow. I don't know if he meant that he was just surviving it in his... Uh... <coughs> okay, and, and I also heard from Edgar. Edgar said he had talked to him and he wasn't happy in the nursing home he was in. So I think he actually contracted it and got over it, but he's in a, in a facility now, a different facility. Wow. Uh, huh. Part of that is, is just guessing, but. Different world. Yeah. Hey, Chuck, could you send me that telephone number? Because I have it. had contact with him, and, but, but just re not recently. Okay, you got it. <clears throat> Thanks. Yeah, and thank you, Chuck. Another announcement is for uh, Bob. Uh, Richard wants to do a little presentation for us on lunar and planetary of astrophotography next week. Uh, no, no, the week after, the 23rd, not the 16th, mm -hmm. but the 23rd. So mm -hmm. we should look forward to that, give him uh, probably at least 45 minutes, right, Bob? Yeah, uh, you know, approximately. Uh, certainly won't go over that. Now, I, I, what I'd like to do is present uh, images that I've taken over the past decade, uh, uh, beginning with lunar and then just showing the evolution using different cameras and what you can do with different cameras and different uh, software. And uh, that nowadays we can get fabulous images of the, the moon and the planets with uh, the software that's available. And it's uh, really not difficult to do. So uh, and most of my images I'll show you were taken from Santa Barbara, from our home in Santa Barbara. And some of them were taken from here in Arizona. Um, Arizona and Scottsdale is where I am, um, does have the advantage of more clear nights and more and better seeing consistently. But we've got a lot of light. Okay, so. Hey, Tom. Uh, um, yeah. Sorry, real quick, Rob just sent me a text. Rob Matson, he's trying to get in the meeting and it's oh. saying, please wait, meeting host will let you in soon. <laughs> Yeah, please wait. I, if I'm not looking in the right spot, oh, okay. okay. I'll, I'll click on admit. Okay. Okay. Rob there you Matson. There so, you go. so who is who is Rob Matson? I guess. So he was on uh, two or three weeks ago. Remember, he, he's no video, but he's a guy who worked with at SAIC. Uh, uh, you know, very very. Uh, he, he's the guy who wants to buy a larger uh, telescope to be able to discover comets and asteroids. So. Like, large. I think he's on now. Yeah. I'm hey, on. I'm in. All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah. He, he was audio only. Okay. Okay. All right. Also, so at, at some point, sorry, just he's the one who sent me the serious A, serious B thing. So we could, at some point, if you got that, you want to show it. Um, no, no rush. That's right. That's, I, I think I made a note of that mm -hmm. when I sent out the email I, that you it had that thing. Let's see if I can find that picture that you sent uh let's see uh did i save it under your name probably not it must be under an email be, that'd be neat to take a look at i guess so you're saying that the the sirius b is is what at its point where it's farthest away from the star and you might be able to pick it up yeah in astro astrophotography let's see well, where did you that usually too with small scope these days Visually, I think well, not naked eye, but with a small scope. Okay. You don't need a twenty-five inch refractor to see it. Yeah, I think a six inch would be enough. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Oh yeah. Let's see. So just, uh, I think I saw an article on that somewhere as well. If I share screen, I can show you the email where it's mentioned. So he's talking about. Down the way here. Let's see if I can make that. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. So right now we're over. So the Sirius A is here, mm -hmm. Sirius B, and 
2022 will be about its most distant point. Huh? Yeah. Hmm. And then you pick it up to something like yeah. that. Yeah. Good call. I thought you couldn't see that. I, le I learned years ago because it was real close. I, I thought it would be a perigee apogee, but I guess with stars, it's different. I learned a new term. I'm looking for it now. Astroston or whatever. <laughs> or ap Apiston. So, uh, yeah, new term. So, diff different for apogee, perigee when it's stars, I guess. Well, G means Earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I think like apoastron or something. It was a weird word like that. Yeah, I had to look at myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you listen to an apoastron? So an obscure, obscure thing from the past is that I haven't heard it used recently, but Sirius is the dog star and the V star is called the pup. The pup, yeah. Yeah. That's good. And I was using uh, Sirius as one of my uh, calibration stars uh, the other night, and I, I was kind of in a rush to get imaging something. Else, so I thought, I'll do this afterwards, and then I never had time to... I'm, my thought is what I'm going to try to do is um, shoot a, a video of it at a, a very low gain and then uh, stack the, the video frames to see if I can differentiate, you know, between the two. So, uh, so what are you calibrating using Sirius? Position? Um, I'm just trying to, you know, capture it in such a way with, with the latest camera I have, that ASI 533. Okay. So that I could I could dim it down enough on gain and very very low um, very short um, oh shoot uh, shutter speed and then you know maybe like take three minutes of it and then stack those you know it'll be like five thousand images or something and stack those and see if I can differentiate between if if I can see serious to be at all you know so that that was my thought I haven't done it yet and it's been cloudy every night it's been bad. You, uh... If you take a, if you do it visually, you can take a piece, an eyepiece, and you can put a piece of black electrical tape, so it covers about half the uh, eyepiece inside, and then when you look at the star, you can move the scope so that that piece of electrical tape covers Sirius, and then the B star, mm -hmm. the pup, is not covered, and it gives you a shot at seeing it better. Because the major difficulty is not separation, it's the intense brightness difference between the two. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's why I was just going to try lowering the gain. And then the other thought I had is just to create a mask and yeah, mask it. Mask, yeah. yeah. But I mean, like, software wise, I was going to create a mask. Anyway, anyway, it's just an idea. I haven't done it yet. Yeah. Sounds good. Or, so, a, you know, a, like putting a filter in might help too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Although that might bright, that might dim them both down the same amount. Maybe if there were a color difference, like with Beetlejuice and its companion, or Antares and its companion. Sorry. Yeah. What What about an HDR composition? Take different exposures, so you bring down the brightest areas and bring up the the less bright areas. Yeah. So you take like a, let's say six minutes, three minutes one minutes, 30 seconds, maybe not that many, but if you do that right there, then you bring down the bright areas and the dimmer areas will come up greater brightness. Okay. So Tim Crawford, did you have any progress on your mirror? No, no, uh, I've been, I've been, <clears throat> Yeah, I've been shopping for parts for this bath interferometer, which is driving me crazy. Uh, I got this a little lens for it. I was trying to hold it up to my, uh, in front of the camera here, but holy cow, the, the double, um, double, uh, double convex lens. I mean, it's, it looks like it's almost less than, than, uh, than a quarter inch in diameter. I mean, it's really small. So I don't exactly know how these things are going to be put together, but holy macro, they they are dinky. But as far as the as far as the mirror goes, no, I haven't. But you were asking about uh, parts, you know, building telescopes, uh, moonlight, uh, you know, the moonlight focusers. They used to have components for truss components. So that if you had your truss, uh, your if you wanted to make a truss tube uh, Dobsonian telescope, they had these mounts that you could put on a 
lanyards that you could put on on the um, the mirror box, and then put your put your tubes into them, and then they had these really nice little screws that would tighten them up. And I don't think they carry them anymore. Does I, I anybody think, know? I think Protostar has those things. Protostar, okay, because yeah. I've been really uh, not only for uh, not only for looking uh, for for telescope building, but also. Um, with this project I'm, I'm doing, I'm trying to attach half inch aluminum tubes to, uh, you know, to a stanchion. And I just can't find anything. It, and I'm, I'm at the point now where today I had such a horrible day. I was using what they call stop collars, uh, trying to slip those over the tubing so you can tighten it with a little hex wrench. And it jammed on the aluminum tubing. I couldn't get it off. Maybe it was the cold weather. I don't know what it was. And I literally destroyed it. I mean, I was using pipe wrenches on it. And so I'm at the point where I'm thinking about making my own out of wood because it's not going to be affected so much. It's, it's just a, a horrible deal for telescope Tim, building. Tim, remember, Ooh. aluminum is very sticky. It's really hard oh, really? to machine aluminum because it's sticky. And it's got that oxide film on it. Okay. It, it just, it, it was, is this, uh, what is this, Tom? Is this the, the little uh, mount? Oh, that's Protostar. That, Jerry mentioned Protostar. I wanted to see the website. Huh. The last time I ordered from them, they seemed like they were on the edge. I'm glad to see they're still around. How to order yeah. spiders. <clears throat> well, it's not the spiders. It's these, little, you know, it's the little truss tube. You see how these are connecting to the upper cage here. But when it comes down to the mirror box, they had these, Moonlight had these really neat mounts that would attach to a flat um, surface. Like if, it's, if you can imagine a, a circular uh, round of wood and they would attach directly to that round and then accommodate your truss tubes. And then you could just tighten one knob and they're in. And I, I'll be damned, I cannot find those things. And Moonlight mm. that I know of doesn't have them anymore. Mm. Huh. And they used to have the, they used to carry them almost all that stuff. I just don't think they have them. I looked mm -hmm. all over. Maybe Jim, have you tried them. have you tried emailing Moonlight? No, I haven't. Matter of fact, I've talked to them and I ought to call them and see what the deal is. I, I think they dropped it from their from their website. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I haven't tried Astro Systems. They may have something there. But uh, yeah, I'm looking for that because they, they used to have the real, the one and a quarter um, was a, a, a typical, a typical uh, stanchion that, uh, mount that they used to have. And they were really neat because they had a, like a, it might've been what I'm guessing is a quarter, quarter 20 screw on a knob that you could just tighten. And they tightened to your, they tightened to your, your poles. Um, and, and I think Moonlight was the guy, the guys that had and if you can imagine the end of the, the trusses had a round ball that you would screw in. Right. I've seen those. And yeah. then you would put those round balls in tight in inside these mounts and one screw would tighten down on both of them. It was neat. And uh, I just haven't been able to find them. But yeah, no, no progress on the mirror. I'm getting, I'm at the point now where I'm going to just start testing with the knife edge. So I have to admit I got lazy on it. And on the bath interferometer, I kept looking for plans on the three, the XYZ stage. And I'm beginning to think that uh, you go to a company called gr5.org, I think it is. And they have the parts that are 3D plastic. Uh, 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 they're uh, they're um, um, th uh, 3D. Uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, you know, they're um, ground with 3D CAD, CAD, uh, CAD cam stuff. So uh, uh, you can buy, I think, the parts, the three stages for like $15. And with all the hardware, it was like only 40 and Wow, so that's could, pretty damn good. Yeah, you can put the whole thing together. Uh, I, I think I didn't particularly care for <laughs> what I saw as far as the hardware. They used a, uh, they used like, threaded rod that went through brass tube. <laughs> well, I, when I built the testers for the Ronke testers, I used that brass tubing over a quarter, quarter 20, uh, quarter inch uh, 
uh, threaded rod. I just didn't care for it. I, I much prefer like Teflon if you're gonna if you're gonna go that route. But um, I I just think a brass covering a threaded rod is just not not my cup of tea. I'd rather look into it myself and then but use use those X X Y Z um, stages that they sell. I think it was fifteen bucks to be honest. And then that's they, so you, cheap. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. So anyway, I think it was called GR gr uh, org, I think it is, and that's that, that's the the site. So anyway, uh oh, ah, security. Tom, risk. you kept popping up that picture of the woman who's bringing social justice to astrology. <laughs> 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 I didn't see that. <laughs> yeah, there you go, Bob. I mean, uh, Tom. There's all the parts there that you that you have, and they carry they ca they carry out the supplies <laughs> for all this stuff. I mean, you, the the lenses, the mirrors, and I'm waiting for a mirror to show up that they they just don't have. The mirror I have is about an inch in diameter. I bet it would work. They recommend for these things a 15 uh, millimeter beam splitter. And Mike Chibnick, he gave me a 10 millimeter one. I think it'll work. Uh, so the, the parts that I've yet to get are the, like the laser um, and, and uh, the mirror. But uh, the little stages, yeah, I think that's the stage that they, they sell the parts to. It's all plastic. Hmm. But, you know, it wouldn't, it, 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 you, you can see I, there, there's your little brass tubing and stuff. And, and that slides, the, the rod slides on it. But heck, I mean, if you really want to, you can get, they sell you the hardware, the knobs, the everything for like about 40 bucks. Mm. And, uh, but they, they claim you can get the whole um, bath interferometer, the whole thing for under $150. I just don't know if I want to spend that right now. Well, uh, I'm sorry, I gotta go. All right, Gary. You Good to see you, Gary. Good to see Hi. you. Bye, Gary. Bye, bye. Bye-bye. See you guys. See you, Gary. See ya. Anyway, that's that's it for me. I just, uh, I'm still working on those two things, but I I, 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 I really appreciate, I look, I'll look into Protostar to see if I can find those stanchions, but they're hard to find. Hmm. And I'm at the point just thinking, well, heck, I'm, I'm gonna start making them out of wood, you know, because, <laughs> At least we can we can do that. Hey Tim, I've been wanting to ask you: Is that rainbow was it truly that vivid? No, no. I <laughs> you know I took I took the picture from my front front porch, and the uh, um, it, that particular day it was a little bit less vivid than this. But I edited it just using the iPhone editing. And I just, I played with it a while and finally it, it really brought it up really, really, really bright. And, and then I thought, well, it's a little bit, you know, that's not really realistic. And I said, well, that's good. Good by me. <laughs> remember we were talking a couple of weeks ago on, on how, you know, what the, you know, what, how you, what color the, the stars are and all that. And, and you, you guys said, you just don't, well, here's an example. <laughs> you don't know. What, you, it, it was a, it was a pretty bright <laughs> It was a pretty bright rainbow, though, that day. Not that bright, though. It was the one about two weeks ago, Tim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember right. that. It one. was, that was, it was a good breaking one. rain, uh, breaking the rain, and then I just wa walked out the front door and popped a shot with an iPhone. But what I was surprised at is that the uh, that the iPhone software it just that's inside of it the, for editing. It was it was pretty amazing. It did a lot of stuff. So. Yeah, if you go to the go to the newsletter, Tim Tim's photo made it on the newsletter. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. All right, pretty pretty sweet. Yeah, pretty. Naked Eye was Naked Eye was it was a little bit less than that, but I brought it out because I could. <laughs> oh, and you got the mission there too. Yeah, it's got the mission, and then St. Anthony Seminary from the front porch. You just look straight mm -hmm. up. And yeah. where the rainbow crosses with the mountains at the top there, that's where the waterfall is. So I can mm. literally, when it's raining really hard, I can just go out my front door and grab a pair of binoculars and look up and the, far, the, uh, the waterfall just roaring. Cool. It's right there in front of me.
Huh. So, huh. Uh, pretty good view. Unfortunately, it's only from the front porch. <laughs> That's good. Usually, when the uh, rainbow's that bright, you can see the, uh, the the double refraction rainbow as well. Right. right. And that, that's, I think that belies what I did to it. <laughs> <laughs> Cheater. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, what was what I was asking you guys? How do you know that that's the color or that's what <clears throat> the, the, the stars on you? So, well, you don't. So I thought, well, okay, I'm going to do my bit. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to Bob's uh, talk on the lo lunar uh, astrophotography. I want to see that. that the, the lunar stuff to where I want to hang out for a while. So welcome, Mike Chipnick. Good to see you. <clears throat> Hi, how you guys doing? Good. Hi, Mike. <clears throat> so did you have something on origami that you still wanted to show us? Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, um, go to speaker of... view. <laughs> See, we'll let Mike find that. So, so in the meantime, I'll just say real okay. quick. Uh, okay. Hank, Hank and I have been, uh, I, I bought some stuff for that 4% off discount at Opcore. So I, I put in the chat area there um, <clears throat> and he's, he just placed an order and unfortunately didn't get the, uh, the discount because um, the order was already placed, but I, I was asking him to talk to this guy, Alan, and cancel the order and re replace it. But now they did a 5% uh, off on gift cards uh, before Valentine's Day. And actually with these emails back and forth with Hank, I, I was thinking I may buy one before Friday and just just so I have 5% off for when I want to use it. And, you know, I might, but, uh, and the question I have to all of you is, can you guys get like a, <laughs> place that sell new equipment that's like you know one year you get 10 percent off or something or, or what is that five percent a pretty good deal or what do you think you know no, you, can five. From, you can buy from things uh <laughs> at astronomics and i think it's oklahoma and yeah we'll ship it to you and there's a shipping charge but there's no california tax on it so you save eight percent that way oh okay do they sell everything? They got a pretty good. Uh, yeah, they have a very, very large inventory. I haven't bought anything in many years, but that used to be my main go-to place. Astronomics, okay. Yeah. What, Jerry? What about that uh, wild bird? And uh, there was one up in up, uh, the upper up in Washington. Anacortes wild bird. Yeah, yeah Anacortes. I don't think they had any discounts though. No. I never bought anything from them. I did. I I visited their store once. It was very disappointing. Oh, really? Yeah. It was mostly guns. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> the wild birds. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, I've gone to that <laughs> site a lot and everything, and then I finally yeah. called the guy, and you guys had said you knew the guys, and I talked to this guy, and he said, there are two of us. There's, there's him and one other guy, you know? So it, so I thought, oh, okay, I thought they were bigger than that. But, I mean, they they... You know, they, they sell a lot of stuff, but there are only two guys to, that are salesmen, so, yeah. <laughs> well, Scope City was kind of in between. They, 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 for the longest while, they had a relatively small uh, uh, place where you could visit, and it, it was about, uh, about 20 feet by 40 feet, and they had all their telescopes, but behind there was all the stuff they had all the equipment from um, that were they were doing making the mirrors and making telescope mounts for the the brand that they had that they bought out um, <coughs> they moved from across are you, the are you talking about the one in costa mesa no the one in simi valley which was the mothership which was what scope city yeah scope city i think they're out of business Yes, they yeah. are. They, um, uh, the, yeah, I was going to say they've definitely closed the office in uh, in Costa Mesa probably at least five years ago. Yeah, there were two they, brothers. Uh, their, their brand of telescopes and eyepiece was Parks. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And then they bought a Lumicon, and then they yeah. bought uh, a bunch of other stuff. Uh, Maurice <laughs> was in charge, and. Uh, um, some of the people in my club didn't particularly care for him. I don't know. It was sort of like a, 
a personality thing, but I always got a good deal. Um, always managed to get a um, reasonable price. And um, what happened was Maurice um, uh, was in a bad car accident and was incapacitated. And his brother, who is a much, a really nice guy, came from the Las Vegas. He ran the Las Vegas store and ran that for the last few years of, of the business. And then you could go in the back where they had all the old stuff um, and buy used and um, seconds and stuff like that. It was really great. Um, I kind of missed that. You know, you didn't have to go to RTMC to get your, uh, you know, in, uh, ends and pieces, so to speak, to, to finish a product project and go there. So, I, you know, I bought a, a few things, but then they, they closed up. Um, I know Bill Bluzen uh, used to blame them for, he said at RTMC, they used to have a huge uh, Celestron and Mead would bring their seconds and have a big pile of stuff that at really discount prices. And he was blaming a Scope City guy for coming in once and just buying it all up and then reselling it. And so- uh, it's, it's possible, but you got other people that did the same thing too. Yeah. I mean- uh, So Celestron and Mead stopped doing it. Yeah, well- you know, there, there, there are people, I don't know about you, there you always seem to be a bunch of people that walk around with shopping baskets and just buying up everything, you know, you're, you're kind of wondering, you know, uh, back in those days, they were like in their, well, you, you know, it, a lot of it got cleaned out unless you were there the first 10 minutes of the swap meet, you know, so. Um, but anyways, um, yeah, I, I want to talk to you about something that I kind of was digging into, and I actually gave a small talk last night to my club about origami and its applications to spacecraft and to uh, uh, telescope making. Um, and that it's sort of like an art form that's been around for about one or 2,000 years that's in the last century has been codified into a science where you can build just about anything from uh, shape sh shifting rovers to um, uh, all sorts of things. And one of the one of the bits of origami um, that uh, most people don't realize is the stents that go in your arteries. That's origami shape. They they shove it in with a catheter and they pull on it and it expands out. It's because of the uh, a mirror, I can't pronounce the guy's name, the fold, the special fold that expands it. And that's how the stents are placed in your arteries. And one of the things that I'm working on is a focuser. And also for my uh, uh, bath interferometer, I didn't want to spend a hundred bucks on a thing there. So I've got a thing here where, I don't know if you can see it, it's going up and down here. Um, it's 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 fairly rigid. This is made out of foam board and um, um, actually uh, uh, polyethylene um, flex stuff that's supposed to go in joints to keep out the the the, uh, the wind. And so eventually, I'm going to go and use uh, better hinges. But it's just a concept of uh, what can be done. Uh, this is a form of origami, and uh, uh, there's a machine company that used to sell focusers, Clement, or just like that. The Clement focuser, only yeah. that was like a four thousand yes. dollar thing, and I'm trying to get away for a lot less. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, so an another thing <laughs> was uh, this here. The um, this is a um, a, a, a Mura fold, and I don't know if I can do it right. Okay, but this is this is one of the things that is enamored. You can go Google um, uh, spacecraft and origami, and I got a bunch of uh, websites for you to take a look at. But NASA is going gaga over this because it's being used from anything from light sails to booms to uh, the, the Japanese implemented, um, uh, was the first spacecraft to implement it where they had a 
um, uh, a solar array that unwound itself into a, a large, there you go, um, a, a large thing and they could stow it. And um, it's, 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 it, it's, it's, it's a real science. And, you know, we're, we're all used to origami in, in a way. I mean, one of the, one of the typical things that you get that's origami that you never even think about. You ever go for Chinese takeout? You start with a flat plate and then it gets folded up and all of a sudden you got to, you know, um, something that's, um, uh, you know, holds, holds water. Okay. And this is, I think, one of the techniques right here is the uh, thing where um, um, they were able mm -hmm. to actuate it and expand it. And you can see how this is, you know, very, very simple um, way of doing it. And part of the part of the the, the new wave of the of the origami is making things only work with one fold. Like here's Here's, tweez here's a tweezer, let's get to right, um, where it's just a, a piece of paper that has a couple folds this way and that way. And so just by pushing on this part or just going on this part, you're able to have actuators and uh, uh, let's see, what, what's the other things that... So, you know, one night I was this here, I was I was up to, up to two o'clock in the morning trying to pull yeah. this <laughs> because I started out wrong and go, I want to get this done. I want to get this done. So, but I, I can do it a lot quicker. But um, here I can show you, um, if you allow me to share a screen, I'll, I'll go put up something um, that will, uh, a little bit of my talk, okay. So, you know, it, it's been around for a long while and it uh, originated in China and Japan because they use it as part of their, they, they believed in uh, little tokens uh, to represent uh, the spirits and stuff like that. And so um, in, in the last um, hundred years, they've gone from the classical and they started thinking about, well, how do you start with a flat piece of paper and make, a, a, and make something? And in the, the couple of decades ago, they got into rigid and thick origami, where with rigid, you have, um, it's similar to some of that uh, solar cells stuff that you have, where you can bend it. Um, and uh, thick origami is where you actually take something like this foam thing, like I've been showing you, putting hinges on and implementing things. So, um, I, I got a bunch of websites here I can send to you if you want to. Uh, but um, on a video, um, we have a, a couple of scientists. They, you know, one of them, the, the foremost scientist, started out as a laser engineer for NASA and somehow got into origami because he needed to implement things. And this here shows um, one of the scientists where they made a six foot uh, uh, directional antenna for radio communications that when it folds down, it's fits in the size of a toaster. And uh, part of it is the mathematics, how you fold things. You don't, uh, with thick origami, you don't want to fold more than once. And so there's a whole mathematics about it. And so this is um, some of the, the spacecraft that uses it. The James Webb, when you really take a look at it, is an origami structure because it folds and all of a sudden you've got this flat plate. And so um, there was uh, some work into that. Um, again, uh, radio antennas and also um, shape-shifting autonomous rovers. And that, um, they got a couple of videos. It's really interesting. They're, they're, they're uh, uh, they got them working sort of, you know, with the, you know, common materials and then they're starting to work on some of the new materials. So. There's the web, and you can see how it gets folded up, uh, especially. Whoa. Okay, that's a big telescope. Yeah. Yeah. And the sail part it was that big. Oh yeah, and the sail parts origami too. And uh, the part of the problem with the you know their origami 
Well, it's not a problem. It's what origami solves um, with the mathematical, the, the way that they got the new geometry, very simplified way of pulling on something and all of a sudden you've got a structure that, that becomes fully um, done. And so here's one um, where the, 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 uh, the, a proof of concept de, um, and devised by a, uh, um, an, an intern on how do you make a rover uh, that you can compress into something very narrow. So their idea is to, is to flesh the, the, uh, the segments out with batteries and solar cells and electronics, which they can do and hinge it all together and then fold it up and then drop a bunch of these and have them all explore. And since they're rel relatively, you know, cheap to make and- um, These look like the kids' toys of Transformers. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, um, if you take a look at the video and I'll send you the video, um, um, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And uh, uh, right here is they, they are doing a, a drop test um, on there and you can see how the whole structure flexes and all that and takes, you know, uh, is, is able to survive, you know, being dropped or, you know, falling over and stuff like that. So they're doing a lot of that. So um, the, there's, there's a lot, there's, there's a really a lot going on with the origami. And one of the things, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, whoops, stop share, um, is, is taking this structure and going a couple further because think of a telescope that's made out of these structures. Um, right now, the way that I have this the dimensions is that this the structure is basically can um, fold into one sixth its height. Okay, so I'm trying to. Okay, so what you can do here is make a, make a mirror box and have it expand out. And when it's expanded out like this, it's really rigid. So you can put a couple of these on top of each other, and all of a sudden, you've got a um, a an origami telescope where it you start out with something relatively flat, maybe maybe something about this thick, and all of a sudden you've got a full tube that's super rigid. And this, this foam stuff is really rigid stuff. Uh, I've used it- Well, that has a, uh, if that technology is advanced enough, maybe Oumuamua has a different shape every solar system it goes into. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, there, there's, 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 there's other things too that you could do with this. There's um, other folding techniques for um, twisting and expanding and stuff like that. I haven't even explored that, um, but um, there's so many papers written now on this type of thing where they're trying to figure out how to make just about anything out of origami, anything you think of. Uh, you go on some of these web pages and there's origami uh, starfighters and stuff like that, but there's other structures where they're using the, the rigid origami for, um, for, uh, for building things. And when you think about it, um, when people go to other planets, the simplest thing to make maybe is some flat stock that they go fold later on into a habitat or some other machines, you mm -hmm. know, where they, they flex it and all of a sudden it becomes something different. Anyways, end of talk. Hey, anyways, it's great to see everybody. I'll see you all later. I got to go. Okay, Joe. Yeah. I'm not long for this world either, but I'm going to hang out a couple more minutes. <laughs> okay. So real, so real quick, I, I put a link in the chat room. There, I, I remember this company in Carpinteria, Astro Aerospace. I'm not sure if they're still there anymore, but I looked them up just while you were talking, Mike, and they uh, they're part of Northrop Grumman. And I remember because I actually interviewed with these guys years ago. They have uh, deployable space antennas and all sorts of structures. And if you go to that uh, link that I have in the um, chat room there, it's it's kind of cool because they show them. And I, I remember too, because they have these things that as they deploy in space, they snap into place. And they're we, let, me, let me tell you something. It, before the um, 
planetarium in Santa Barbara was uh, remodeled. They had a boom in a, in a corner with a crank and a, a pulley that kids yeah. used to go do and undo. It, it was like about 20 years ago, they had that. It was an exhibit. I, 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 bet, it, I bet it was from these guys because they, mm -hmm. they were the they were the guys making it, you know. So mm -hmm. yeah. we had we had somebody come to a a, a meeting at the, at the at the museum a few years back, and he and I don't know if he was from uh, JPL or what. And you remember Chuck? The guy had this really cool little uh, uh, flick fiberglass gizmo that would it would expand into a tube shape, and then you could just like press yeah. the thing together and twist it, and it would just become just a flat, just one flat little uh, circle. That was I it. think that was AEC Able or some other company like that that used to be in the in the park down there in Goleta. Oh, really? That but they, they, the thing, they the deployed thing was space systems very similar to the ones you were showing us. So they may become part of that uh, Northrop Grumman. Uh, yeah. Bit. I know they had an office right next to our Northrop Grumman office there uh, by the uh, train station in Goleta. But they kept coming to us and asking if we had any work because they were kind of being strangled to death by Northrop Grumman. So I don't know if they're still around or if they were just trying to get them to move out of Santa Barbara and move down to L.A. Oh, boy. Speaking about Santa Barbara, uh, just before I moved up here, um, I actually got contact with the last of the three or four partners of the Santa Barbara Instrument Group. One of them is still here in the lo in the local area, and he sells. He was selling um, astronomical cameras, but they weren't Santa Barbara. Group. Is that Mike yeah. Barber or? I might have been, because he's come and given talks a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, I remember that guy. Oh, not not a whole second. Mike Barber was the technical guy. This was the uh, uh, the other guy. Um, yeah, there were two um, guys that started it, and they were both technical and business. Right, one was Schwartz, Richard Schwartz, What's that? Richard Schwartz and Barber. Okay, worked for Raytheon, as I remember. Yeah, they worked for Santa Barbara, uh, the systems division at SBRC, going back a few years. Mm -hmm. That company was bought uh, by an entrepreneur up in San Francisco. And then he ran it for a couple of years and decided there was no big future in it, even though they had a backlog for their CCD cameras, but it was mostly for microscopes and machine, uh, machine, machine vision. And so then eventually he got rid of that and sold it to the group that makes the software, software BISC. So that's who owns it now. Isn't it Cyanogen that owns them? The Canadians? Yeah. I think... I think that's the same thing. Okay. I don't know. I kind of lost track of it over the last few years. I know. But an entrepreneur in San Francisco. What's that? Software Abyss does like the mighty mounts and the and the, the fancy mounts. They do um, um, the one that the software the, the planetarium program now that is Sky uh, Safari. Delirium. Sky, the Sky, Sky X. Sky X. Oh, Sky X. Yeah. yeah, and they make those red um, the mounts. Paramount. Make the paramounts. paramounts, yeah. Beautiful. Mounts. So the uh, when the when the guy in San Francisco owned it, he had the manufacturing in San Francisco, <laughs> but he kept the R and D and development area here in Goleta. Mm -hmm. But they did oh, no really? sales out of here. Yeah, it was near where I worked, um, Sanchez Boulevard, or I'm I'm, forget, I'm starting to forget the the. the uh, the streets, but it was, it was the old old Clinet building, the guy that tried to make Clinet cars on a Lincoln chassis mm -hmm. back in the 80s. <laughs> yeah, and it was it's over by their uh, Castilian Drive. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Hey, Mike, I wanted to let you know that uh, Westminster Village has ordered a next dome. And it's going to be here probably around the middle of April. So we get this all together. We're going to have a little observatory here. Good. One of the things. Well, are, what are you going to put in it? Uh, I'm going to put in my my 11 inch edge, Lustron SCT, and uh, and 
my cameras and stuff. I'm going to be donating all this to Westminster Village. And so we'll, we'll get it operating. I'm going to be trying to work with people here and find some people that will work with me. Okay. It's yeah. very exciting. It's caused a yeah. lot of interest. Yeah. yeah. I, that, I, use my, I use my 11 inch in the, uh, my, my next dome. Um, it's hey, Bob, have you ever seen Mike's, uh, his mascot that hangs out outside the observatory? <laughs> <laughs> no. You, you have a picture of that guy, Mike? <laughs> oh jeez! <laughs> I probably do. Yeah, yeah. who's this? I, I, it'd be hard for me to find it. I've got so much. You got to put on one of those guys outside your observatory. <laughs> Keep critters away. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. It's, what was that guy called? Just a critter. <laughs> I called him Bob. Uh, Bob. Call, <laughs> yeah. Because I because I worked with Bob Lazar before he went to. Uh, do those crazy things in uh, Nevada, you know. You know. <laughs> that, that there's a whole cottage in, industry about Bob, you know, ignoring the fact that they could find out where he was working, where he went to school and all that, you know. There's nothing like a little bit of conspiracy uh, theory that, that goes really well on TV, so. Um, <laughs> but, uh, here, here it is. Let me see if I got him right here. Oh, you got Bob? That'd be cool. Yeah, there's Bob. Yeah, there he is. Okay. Hey, that might be a good idea for us here. <laughs> okay, let me tell you the story of it. My <laughs> wife bought that for my birthday. And there's this place that's 60 miles away called Pottery, Pottery uh, Village. And they had this there. And uh, the first time we went, my wife <laughs> saw it. And didn't tell me about it and then she went and got it and evidently it was a very popular thing with the, the employees and as she was taking it out the the guy who owned the place went over the speaker and says well we we, we sold we sold bob anybody any employee want to say their last respects to them you better do it now because he's going to a new home no. <laughs> well, you give me some ideas here, huh? Yeah. So for for a while, Bob had a had a face mask on too, but it kept coming off in the wind. So. Bob is a very good son. He doesn't talk back to us. <laughs> Just nice he, and quiet. They, um, hi, Robin. Hi. Make it so I can hear them. Oh, okay. Okay. Wait a second. Can't wear a face mask. I've got no wait, ears. I can't. I still can't hear them. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Wait, we wait, can wait. hear you. Well, I kind of can't hear you. Well, one second. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Well, it was at Pottery World, and when I I went back with a friend who had a van because I couldn't put it in my Honda sticking out through the sunroof. <laughs> that would have been good though. <laughs> Sacramento back home here to Rio Vista, and they were having a half price sale. But he was, his name was Paul there. And Paul oh, wasn't half yeah. price. And when I went into the, uh, to the register area, I asked them, I said, you know, what is, is Paul half price? And they said, no. And I told them the story about Mike's observatory and how I thought it would be so awesome to have him <laughs> next to the observatory. So then they gave him to me half price. Oh, that's cool. That's, that's cool. cool. Yeah. He was expensive, <laughs> but well worth it. He's a great conversation piece. Has a complaint hey. once about the cold or the rain. They keep people out of the backyard. <laughs> I know, but we. I tried to get clothes for him, but his head is too big. And then to put a, a shirt on him, do you see how big his hands are? Yeah. Can't put a shirt I on him. Put a shirt through his hands through you have a to shirt. Cut, cut the back off completely. Yeah. Mm. I'll have to design like a robe or something around him. Yeah, cut the back off and then velcro it back on. <laughs> Take care. You have to Did find a power for aliens. Bye. <laughs> Hockey jersey would work. Yeah. So, so what, Mike, Mike Chibnick, what, what size is your next dome? And, and Bob, are you, Richard, are you getting the there's, same size? There's exactly one size. Um, and that is, it's eight, it's eight feet or two meters. And, um, 
it's going to be a little tight in there with the 11 inch. Uh, let me warn you, but um, if you don't put it on, I, I've got it on one of these duplex bars where the refractor is on one side and the other. I'd, I'd suggest put them on top of each other and uh, um, you'll have more room to walk around with. Um, it's, uh, um, but it's nice inside. It's, it's nice inside. Um, one of the things that's really nice about this dome is because it's white, it really stays cool in the hot days. We've had some 100 degree plus weather and it always seemed like it, it was a lot cooler inside than it should have been. Um, so. That's good to hear because we get it really hot here. Right. You're talking right. 115 degrees. Oh, right. Scottsdale, Scott, Scottsdale's good in March. <laughs> Does it leave? Oh, it in uh, Nine the, months of the year, Scottsdale is fabulous. We we have incredibly good weather here. Yeah, we've for had nine some, months of the year. We've had some bad rain here and some driven rain, and the only leaks that I could really see would have been through the bottom. Uh, it's plywood on a bottom, and so it puddles up there, and uh, I. I've had to work at that um, to, to keep it to keep it out. I would, I um, the finish on there is such that the, the caulk doesn't stick to both the surfaces uh, on, on the thing there uh, on the dome skirt and the uh, and and the wood. So I've been working on that. I've finally gotten that uh, fixed a little bit. It's, We've uh, ordered. Um... We've ordered a cover. They have a cover now for the dome, so we ordered that. Yeah, I would suggest that. I didn't get it. protection. Yeah, there's and there's a couple of small gaps in there that rain might come down. I, I, you know, but for the most part, it doesn't go up underneath the the skirt there, even though it seems like you know you can almost look out of it. Uh, uh, the the other challenges. You know, yeah. One of the challenges we have here is that. Uh, many of the residents here are in wheelchairs or walkers. So what we're going to do is design this to use video cameras to project images right. into a nearby room yeah. where people can sit and observe right. these. Yeah. One of the, one of the things I did, if you zoom out a little bit, um, I positioned the door next to the side of the platform. So it provides a step that you uh, zoom out. Uh, yeah. It provi provides a step so you can step in there because that door is a little bit low. Um, uh, so you have to be a little limber, you know, make sure that you can bend down and duck underneath there. Yeah. How tall is Paul or Bob there? Taller than my wife. <laughs> How tall is Bob? Um, he's about, uh, about four foot and a half. Or uh, no, he's about five feet. Okay. Okay. So you have to stoop down to get in there. Oh yeah, you do. That's the that's the only negative thing of, about this. Um, uh, if I had my druthers, I would have gotten a dome on a uh, like a, a t top of a tough shed to to, to raise it up a little bit. Um, the, the way that this dome is designed is for either an SCT um, or a reflector. Okay, if it's a reflector, you need to be higher up in there. So the dome needs to be a little bit lower. But with an, SC, an SCT, if you're looking at it, actually the dome could be a little bit higher. And in this case, um, uh, you know, if, if the dome was like one or two foot higher, than it is now, then it would have been fine, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, the the bay is is pretty good. I wish I had another bay, but um, a single bay gives you a lot of room to put a computer on there and look at things and uh, 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 you know have have your stuff. Uh, there's enough room for a small cart to put pieces and accessories and stuff like that and inside I hang up things like the button off mask and cables and, and other things 
And one of the things I discovered is um, that the, the top ring there, um, just below the, the dome part, um, is wide enough that they, they've got some of these inexpensive bicycle lights. And you just shove them in there and turn them on and they shut yeah. them down. Okay, that's so a great that's, idea. So that's a really yeah, good idea. For, for lighting, you, you want a little bit of lighting inside there. Um, an, another thing, too, I discovered is uh, the slit tends to be a bit grabby. Um, and what I did was I put some uh, uh, car wax on there, and it seems to slide really good now. So uh, um, Good. Yeah. Well, if we get in a jam, I may be I may be contacting you again, Mike. Okay, <laughs> right. The, the 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 one thing that you really want to do with this dome is where that the uh, where the the bottom of the dome that rotates. You want to try and get all those segments so that you don't have any discontinuities between the different segments. Otherwise, the wheels bump and makes a big noise, and sometimes it catches. Um, <clears throat> Um, I, 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 I found that to be, um, I, I didn't realize it until they put it together and we got it all together and it was up there and all my friends went away. Uh, so I couldn't fix that, but you want to get those parts really there so that the wheels just glide underneath there. Right. So, uh, so, um, Mike, it, Mike, it looks like looks like the top of the dome is not even sitting on there. It looks like it's tilted a little bit. Is that true? No, it's level. It's just the way that it looks. Okay. Uh, and do you, the, do you, the ground do you is need, not level. Uh, Mike, do you need a, a dew shield on your scope when you're using a dome? Yes, because of the fact that the C11, okay, with a camera on the back, you have to shove the C11 forward so it's closer to the to the slit, and so what I wound up doing was making a custom uh, dew shield out of foam that uh, just uh, mm -hmm. is long enough but short enough, if you know what I mean, so it doesn't catch on the on the dome. That's very interesting, um, but I'm going to have to leave. So okay. All right. good night, everybody. Okay. Good night, Jerry. Good, night, Jerry. Good, night, Jerry. good discussion. Yeah. But it's it's pretty good quality. I mean, it's one of the few domes that you can get that you don't need a semi to get. I mean, because it comes in a bunch of big boxes. I got pictures of that. You know, that comes in sort of like a five foot by uh, four foot by three foot box, and all the pieces are there. There's a couple of boxes, and um, and so it's it's easy for one or two people to set up. Um, you just drag the pieces over, no pieces, you know, uh, is more than like about 20, 25 pounds. And so, yeah, when you put it together, the dome is this big thing that weighs about maybe 80 pounds and you need three people to just because it's ungainly, but um, you get it on there, poof, it goes on and it's, it's there. And we've had some major wins and uh, I, I was surprised how well it was. Um, and uh, there's there's nothing like having 30 mile an hour winds and your telescope is not shaking, you know. That's, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's that's great. Uh, well, you'd be interested to know one of the good things about doing astronomy here is we have no dew, absolutely no dew, mm. hardly ever, because the air is so dry. So you don't need a dew do, do, uh, do, a dew shield. Yeah. But but dew shields also help from the standpoint of ambient uh, light pollution. Yes. Okay, that's so, what I use mine for is, is yeah. cutting out ambient light. Yeah, yeah, right. But so we don't have to worry about dew. But but there's nothing like going out there and knowing, turning on the computer, computer and the and and the telescope, and knowing, hey, I don't have the polar line. You know, yeah. everything's set up. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And uh, that's that's one of the the, the nice things. And uh, and believe, yeah, believe, right? believe me, the older the get, the older I get, the more I like that. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. How, how we is missed the gun guys. club here? We used to go up to the gun club. It was really neat. They even had a pad there that had a place where people could put the SETs on. 
I never well, went to there. I I, I kind of lost out on that. It, it, it was a, it's a nice little spot. Well, what, mm -hmm. well, right now with 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 Shark Cap and the other stuff and uh, the Pole Master, you can pull or align the telescope to take photography in a matter of a few minutes. Where uh, you know. Um, Drift aligning is a is a royal pain, and uh, you know I, I I used to go up to find us with with Hallis and um, and uh, uh, the, a bunch of the other guys, and the first night it would be setting up and polar aligning. Then the next night they could start doing things because they needed to be that accurate. But uh, um, hey guys, I'm going to have to take off. I'll, I'll see okay. you next week. Okay, take care, okay. everybody. Hey, right. hey. Hey, I, I noticed in the uh, that uh, you're having good success with the uh, plate solving with the knee, uh, with the uh, Raspberry Pi. Congratulations on that. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, that's. I and I, um, I'm feeling confident enough now that I'm. I've ordered the camera. <clears throat> There's a new um, camera, the AC2600. It's an APS-C size sensor actually, and um, it's got great specs. Uh, it's um, on pre-order now at OPT. So I ordered that and I'm also going to get the seven filters and the 36 millimeter seven filter wheel. So you got a monochrome camera, that's that's good. Yeah, it's, it's a monochrome, yeah. So it's going to be a lot harder, but um, yeah, I've been pretty successful now with my mount finally, I've tamed the beast. Um, yeah, it was mostly these, um, so the, the Lost Mandy, the, the cogwheel is not rounded. That has uh, caused binding up of the Lost Mandy a lot. And it took me <laughs> forever. But now that the, the spring-loaded worms that I made, that are, by the way, very ugly, but they work very well. Now oh, you made like, your own? OK, good. That's, that's cool. Now I've got, got 0.5 arc second uh, total RMS. And uh, that's pretty damn good. And uh, yeah, the, the plate solving helps because I was also, you know, First doing, doing my polar alignment, then then one star alignment, and then you hope that you get to the target, but it's always off by by a bit, and it's just a pain in the, in, in the rear. And I'm, now with, with the pie and plate solving, it's just, you know, you wait for a little bit, and it's done, and it, it's uh, dead on. I haven't been able to make plate solving work with my, my MISO, and I've been fighting with uh, pointing issues. Um, I've gotten a, 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 a little bit better, um, but that's the only way that you're going to be able to find things now is with plate yeah. solving, you know, because things, things flex and um, you're not always accurate enough. And, uh, yeah. but, but I, I like the fact that you're doing things with it's, it's inexpensive, it's low power, it's small. And if things break, you can fix it. You know, so that's true. That's, yeah. That's I, I, by the way, I did order a Pi 4B, which is the, the power, by you know it's, it's uh eight gigabytes or something like that because when i get this mono camera i will have to be streaming uh, images and so on so i need more power in the background because everything everything runs on the pi and i use uh, vnc to remote log into it so I, I, I do it from my galaxy tablet which altogether it works fine but i think i'm going to need more power so that's why i ordered the pi 4b one of these days, I'd like to talk offline with you more uh, about your setup and how you get things going. I've got a Raspberry Pi 2, okay. but I probably yeah. need to get a Pi 3 in order to get uh, uh, that going on. Yeah, please do. And, and you know, this, this stuff is really good. It's uh, also sold commercially as an AC Air, and you probably read about that or heard about that, but it's basically a Raspberry Pi that's running Ecos, so you can get it for free, at least the software for free. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the AC Air also has a few few power outlets or something like that, but you know you can take care of that in a different Well, way. what's really good about it is you can mount it on your telescope and yep. in in a way, and it's <clears throat> wireless. Uh, that's 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 the Achilles heel of all our telescopes now is all the cables we have to deal with. Um, uh, it's it's a royal pain, and getting right. it down to one or two cables is uh, it's like the holy grail. You know, yeah. So, to speak. so anyway, right now, yeah, I'm still imaging with an uh, with a, a DSLR, and the one that I have cannot be controlled remotely because it's a Fuji, a modified Fuji XA1. Um, so the uh, plate solving, I've done that with the um, auto guider. So I've, I've uh, you know aligned the auto guide scope with my um, DSLRs, 
field of view yeah. and and that way i just do it with the guide and, and the nice thing is that once you do that then the guider is already hooked up so once you've got the image then you can start to pre press the guide button and boom you're you know guiding right so it's kind of cool yeah okay I'm pleased about that so, so bob you're still uh um fiddling around with the uh pix insight and and all that yeah um so here i'll just do real quick uh we're almost done here do a share screen. Uh, this this is my um, this is the old camera, the, the good old Orion Nebula. Once again, <laughs> there's a lot of processing with this, and um, so this is with that that previous camera again, the ASI uh, two two four one. But a, a lot of processing in in PixInsight to get that definition in in the center there. Cool. And that, then. Uh, See if I can do this. So you bought the license, right? Um, you know, oddly enough, I, I had the 45 day trial and it ran out, but I've had my computer on for for about two and a half weeks since it ran out and I haven't, I, I haven't shut down PixInsight and it still works. So I am gonna buy it, <laughs> but I'm just, I just keep using it and using it. But yeah, I think it's like $270 or something to buy it, so. Yeah. That's what I use, PixInsight. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty amazing. It's just good software package. Yeah, so much to learn with it. So, so this, this is that you know that half of the image is a Thor's helmet thing, and I, I think, it sort of looks like a big circle here. You know, I think that's noise, uh, but I think near the bottom here is where I have it. I kind of have to do the plate solving to get this lined up properly. I didn't even know till I finished processing that I had this track through here too. So I should have eliminated. Are you stacking using median stacking or are you using average? Uh, this is using using average. It, it, it depends. This is average. Uh, there, there's so many different settings on it. Yeah, I, but I, mean, I would is... suggest that you go to medium if you would and then uh, use distortion correction. Okay, I mean, at what step? I mean, at, at uh, image well, generation. Well, I use the preprocessor script. I don't know if you could do that to do the stacking. And inside there, when you go to your lights, you can select distortion collect, uh, uh, distortion correction, because otherwise it'll only set a default of 500 stars. So if you use distortion correction, uh, it can use you can use fewer than 500 stars or more, depending on how it does. It takes longer to do it. But uh, yep. sometimes, like for example, if you're using uh, 24 millimeter or something like that, a very very wide field lens, what happens if you don't use distortion correction, you will get stars that'll just be blanked out because uh, you don't. And, and then also that that happens if you don't use outlier rejection. I don't know if you use any outlier rejection at all, but I would suggest that you use outlier rejection because that can cause problems as well. Why? Well, Right now, I'm I'm going by the the, the PixInsight book and then various uh, YouTube videos. And what I'm doing, I am eventually going to do instead of the uh, batch preprocessor, they suggest use that weighted batch preprocessor. Pre but oh, okay. you can't. But what I'm using is manual methods the whole way through. So an oh yeah, automating. I'm doing I'm doing separately. So I'm you know, and they say that with uh, batch preprocessing, you can get in trouble because you can't set settings in between. And I'm, I'm trying to just do it manually the whole mm -hmm. way. And then eventually I'm gonna, I wanna, I wanna do that whole script too, you know? But um, yeah, so this is just gonna take take some time. So I'm trying to remember. Yeah, yeah I mean. median, I would suggest that would be a better way to go. You have to take more samples and then it's uh, your signal to noise ratio is, is the square root of the number of samples instead of averaging, so. Yeah, yeah. What about sigma? Um, yeah, outlier rejection. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. So um, that it's the suggestion they were, you know, the, the guy in the video was saying that use the sigma clipping, and then the book said to use something else. So again, it's just I'm early on in it. So uh, Pix Insight uses Winserized sigma clipping, which yeah, is, that's, is that's basically was, a, a variation of sigma clipping. But I would suggest that you use sigma clipping, and you can change the sigma value to figure out how far away from how many deviations you want to be. It's just a multiplier to the deviations that you want to reject out anything beyond that. So for yeah. example, like on a 24 millimeter shot, if you don't do outlier rejection, you'll get areas that are just completely dark. 
of stars because uh, they're, they're getting canceled out. So that's a good reason right there for using it. Now, I've got a question. The, the fact that you guys got fixed in sight, does that um, mean that you don't have to necessarily use Photoshop afterwards? It's got enough tools and stuff for you to go and do it? Yeah, yeah you're, you're pretty much doing all that. I mean, I guess you could, but I mean, you're, you're doing everything that you could do in that because you can stretch the thing and you know, with the histogram, you can do all sorts of, uh, you know, color, color corrections. And I mean, I'm just discovering so many things in there. It's just, a, it's a very complex tool. Um, again, you could still do that and you don't even have to, there is a, for stacking, they call it image integration. They don't call it stacking inside PixInsight. But there's no reason you couldn't use Deep, Deep Sky Stacker and then take your final stacked image and then process it in PixInsight. I've done that. Several but, times, but yeah. but but what I meant was like doing layers and stuff like that, and not, and for wide dynamic range, like with this here, you know, somehow getting getting short exposures, working on that, another layer, medium exposures. Oh yeah, then, well you, and, yeah. You what I do it? is okay. I use something. I was talking a little bit earlier about this. It's something called HDR composition. Yeah. What that does, HDR stands for high dynamic range. So mm. in other words, what it's going to do is it's going to bring down the most intense areas and, and then you can still get the, the fainter areas. This is uh, all I, did, I did this on M42 because M42 is a good example oh, yeah. of an area where it's extremely bright where the trapezium is and yet it's dimmer on the edges. Uh, oh. And what I did is I did six minutes three minutes, one minute, and 30 seconds. And then I actually did 10 seconds. But by the time you get combining all these things together, you get so much of a range gradient. So I had to throw the 10 seconds out. The other problem with it is when you start to do things like figuring out point spread functions of stars, you usually use a criteria of 0.3 to 0.8 in value of a scale from zero to one. Well, when you do this, it throw, you, can kind of, you can kind of throw some of that stuff out. The other thing that I found out is the pre, there's something called previews in Pixar site where you choose a small section of the, of the uh, picture to apply these changes to. So let's say, for example, if you're doing a deconvolution, it might take, uh, let's say, uh, ten, two or three seconds or four, maybe five seconds to run that. But if you apply it to the whole picture, it takes seven to 10 minutes. Well, mm. guess what? When you, have, when you have a range compression like this, where you're compressing those, that dynamic range, the preview doesn't work right in pixel sight. Mm. So you have to apply things uh, to it. Let's say, for example, the Gibbs effect that you get with ringing around stars in deconvolution. OK, you have to apply these things and do it. And it takes minutes and minutes and minutes to go through this to get the settings right, because you can't do a preview. So those are the, those are some of the complications that you get into. Take an object like M13, where you have a very bright nucleus and you want to get resolution on those stars. You're going to have to do an HDR composition to do that. Uh, I can show you some shots where you can all the way down into the very nucleus of things. Same thing with M31. The nucleus is so bright compared to the outer edges of the galaxy that you can't really see anything. So, so like what you're saying too about layers, so and what he's talking about with the HDR, the HDR, what you can do is it's setting up masks. So you can mask out everything except the really bright area, like in the middle, you know, where the trapezium is here. And then just work on that by bringing the detail into that and ignoring the rest of the image. So in effect, that's what's doing layers when you really get down to it because of the masks and all that. Because of the yeah. Or you talk about layers like in Photoshop. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah. So it's a substitute. It's a substitute for doing the layers. I'm, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, there's certainly layers because what you can do is um, you, you can... 
you do things like uh, grabbing a luminance of an image and then dragging that on it and then differencing the luminance with the image and then only working on the difference. And then you can invert the luminance mask. I mean, you, so there, there, there essentially are ways of doing layers in, in PixInsight, but they get they get pretty complex with it. But uh, and I know, and I, I'm sorry, Hank, I know we were talking about this before and you said, I got to do a presentation on this at some point. But it, it you know, so I just want to describe a little bit in terms of- uh, well, That's good. How you, how you hey guys, it. I've got to go. It's an hour later here, so I've got to go too. So see you, so, see see you in two weeks. See everybody again. It's been a long time. Yeah. Good time to start. Mm -hmm. Stop. Okay, we'll see y'all guys next time. Next Tuesday. Okay, bye. Thank you bye -bye. guys so much. Thank you. Bye, bye Dick. Bye. bye bye. Bye. Bob. 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 <laughs> hey, I'll do. Wait, I'll do stop share here. There we go. Okay. okay. <laughs> And Hank, I, I think I'll uh, email you. I got some other questions for you. Um, not about the buying, but uh, once you get all that stuff set up, I, I'd love to come over and, and see what yeah. you got. That focuser. Too. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at that fun. focuser. That looks pretty interesting. I'd like, I might want to get one of those. Wear a mask. <laughs> uh, actually, real, real quick. I, I got a real quick story. You got, we always hang out the three of us at the end here. Oh, we got Rob on too. Um, I got a call yesterday morning. So since I'm retired, I'm sitting at home and I had an incident where the fence blew down in my backyard and the, the house on the other side is like a senior home. They just have one senior person living there. So I met the manager and he said, hey, we're doing a, um, a vaccination of the seniors here and we have five of them. We have one extra dose of the vaccine. You want to you want to walk over? We get vaccinated. So I got I got vaccinated yesterday. I'm not even I'm not even 65 yet. So. And I, I got an appointment to get my next one in a month. So um, my arm's a little sore, but I'm I'm so happy I got vaccinated. So yeah, excellent. So anyway, separate topic, astronomy. But all right, so. you guys, we'll see you next week. All right, see you. Thanks, Tom. Good to go.